My name is Scott Nye, and this is Talking Radical Radio. Hello and welcome to Talking Radical Radio, where we bring you grassroots voices from across Canada. We give you the chance to hear many different people who are facing many different struggles talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why they're doing it, in the belief that such listening is a crucial step in strengthening all of our efforts to change the world. On this week's show, I'll be speaking with Trudy Govier. In some ways, when it comes to questions of war and peace, the world is a very different place than it was 35 years ago. In that era, the world was dominated by two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. After a détente period that lasted much of the 1970s, the Cold War tensions between them were once again high in the early 1980s, and the risk of nuclear annihilation felt sufficiently imminent to mobilize hundreds of thousands into the streets in peace marches in Canada in that decade, and millions more in the rest of the world. In 2018, the world is quite a different place. The geopolitical map has changed a great deal. For decades now, the conflicts that have raged around the world have mostly been more localized in character, though of course that hasn't stopped them from causing immense death and destruction. They have prominently included warfare organized along subnational and interethnic lines, as well as more numerous open instances than during the Cold War of the West, led by the United States and generally supported by Canada, engaging in asymmetrical warfare as a means of exerting power in other parts of the world. As for nuclear weapons, they're generally much lower on people's list of concerns these days. And since the many millions around the world that took to the streets in 2003 to oppose the pending US-led invasion and recolonization of Iraq, peace movements, and perhaps even more so in Canada than in other places, have had difficulty mobilizing people in large numbers. So, yes, there are differences between the early 1980s and today. But at heart, a lot also remains the same. War continues to happen in ways that our own country continues to be complicit in. The need to push for other ways of resolving conflict, from the global level on down to the local, is no less pressing. As the existence of social movements of different kinds continues to show, the structural violences of inequality and injustice continue to be fundamental to how our society is organized. And nuclear arsenals that could destroy humanity many times over still exist with the particularly unpredictable character of the current leadership in the United States bringing that danger increasingly back into mainstream consciousness. Trudy Govier has been active in working for peace and justice since the early 1980s. She was part of the group that founded Project Plowshares Calgary in 1982. Her involvement has fluctuated some over the years in response to the vagaries of life, but in 2018 she is still involved and still committed. She has organized and spoken on panels. She has written letters and lobbied. She has produced leaflets and marched. Her work as a scholar and teacher of philosophy has been greatly informed by her participation in the peace movement. More than three and a half decades later, she currently chairs the board of the now renamed and reorganized Plowshares Calgary Society, which disaffiliated in the last couple of years from the National Project Plowshares Organization at the insistence of the Canada Revenue Agency and became an independent nonprofit. Each year, they hold a peace fair. In recent years, they've organized a solemn commemoration of the destruction of the Japanese city of Hiroshima by a nuclear bomb dropped by the United States. They're organizing a conference coming up in May, covering a number of different issues. They're one of the longest continually operating peace groups in Canada, and they even have a staff person and office space. They continue to explore new projects, and Trudy is keen to find ways to expand their work in the coming years in the face of a world that, sadly, is in no less dire need of grassroots work for peace than was true three and a half decades ago. Trudy speaks with me about her many years of working for peace and justice, and about the work of the Plowshares Calgary Society. My name is Trudy Govier. My career has been in philosophy. I've written a number of books and papers. I taught for a while at Trent University in the 1970s, and I more recently taught at the University of Lethbridge, where I was in the philosophy department and retired in 2012. I've been closely involved with Plowshares Calgary off and on since 1982, and currently I'm chairing that group. 
which now operates under the name the Plowshares Calgary Society. Like many people, I became very worried about nuclear weapons issues in the early 80s under the Reagan administration. And as you may know, we had quite an issue in Canada at that time about the testing of the cruise missile in northern Alberta. I had a colleague in Ontario who was very worried about this, and he got me involved. And then, for family reasons, I left my job and moved to Calgary from Peterborough, Ontario. And at that time, I was sort of looking for activities to replace my academic job. And I became very interested in these peace issues. So I and several other people founded the Calgary branch of Project Plowshares. This group was Project Plowshares Calgary between 1982 and 2017. And it's now renamed as a not-for-profit society. So it's now the Plowshares Calgary Society. Tell me about the conversations that led to the founding of the Calgary Group back in 1982 and about the process for making that happen. Well, there was a man here who had actually walked with Russell. Uh, And Russell is Bertrand Russell, the famous English philosopher who was very involved in the anti-nuclear campaign and in lots of other issues during his lifetime. And with the campaign for nuclear disarmament in England. He was a chaplain at the University of Calgary, and he organized events and lectured about this. People were worried and were anxious to do something as a civic organization in the way of informational meetings and participating in marches and letter-writing campaigns and a number of events. And I think initially, the focus was really on the cruise missile and on nuclear-related issues. Since then, we've broadened out a lot. Obviously, if one is worried about war and peace, one can certainly worry about a broad range of issues apart from the nuclear issue, but that was where we did start. It was very worrisome at that time, and it was worrisome that Canada and Alberta were participating in the build-up under President Reagan through testing the cruise missile, which was done in northern Alberta, I think, in 82 and 83. So a lot of people, I think, became involved in these issues in the early 1980s. What kind of actions did Project Plowshares Calgary engage in during the 1980s when you were focused on the nuclear issue? There was a lot of letter writing. We were organizing and participating in marches. We had people, including myself, participating in panels and debates at the university where our co-participants were people from strategic studies and the political science department. We had a lot of meetings and so on. Then with some of our members, my husband did this, I did not do this, but some of our members had campaigns to meet with members of parliament and, you know, discuss with them the progress of this issue and whether or not anybody was paying attention to it. And those went on in the 80s and into the 1990s. Of course, in Alberta, we tended to have all conservative members of parliament, but I mean, a number of these people did meet with our members and did receive information and had some interest in the topic. Who was involved in the group back then? It started with a faith community. The number of students was comparatively small, although they did, of course, attend events at the university. There was a film and lecture series that was organized by a university group, of which I was also a member. That was attended by many fairly educated, you know, interested lay people of a variety of ages. I can remember one event at the peak of our engagement where we had an enormous lecture theater at the university in which there were at least 500 people. And we had Gwyn Dyer. He wrote a book about war in that period and gave a very effective lecture. So these issues were given quite a bit of publicity and concern at that time. And then in the 90s, some of the same people became interested in issues of ethnic conflict. I mean, the parameters of this thing changed after 1989 when people were ready to declare that the Cold War was dead and that for a while it seemed really optimistic for peace issues internationally. And then uh, you got these challenges of all these different subnational nationalistic groups and, you know, issues of separatism, issues of terrorism and so on and so forth. I understand from people that I've known who were involved in the 80s in other cities 
that peace marches were a big part of what happened in those years. Was that true in Calgary as well? Oh, that's correct. There were several peace groups in Calgary at that time, and there were some marches, and yes, our members did go to these marches. We also, we had an interesting project in 1990. NATO has a nuclear planning group, and that group met in the Kananaskis area, which is near Calgary, and they had advertised, well, this was an isolated area, right? And they didn't think Calgary was particularly a very radical place, and this would be a good place to have this nuclear planning meeting as it would be relatively safe from protesters. And we got a small subgroup together. I was a member of it and went up and stationed ourselves in a recreational vehicle near this meeting. And we got alternate press releases in various languages like Italian and German and French and so on. And we gave interviews to some media fairly successfully, giving an alternate perspective on this. That is, given that people had more or less defined at that time there was the threat from the Soviet Union or Russia as being over, what was NATO doing, planning all these things for uses for nuclear weapons and so on. So that was one of our more uh, successful initiatives at that time. Talk more about that moment of transition in 1989, when the Soviet Union collapsed and the Cold War ended, and about what that meant for your group's activities. This is my personal perspective. So different people within the group would have different perspectives. I mean, my perspective is that the peace agenda broadened a lot. You can think, for instance, of the Balkan Wars and the changes from the Soviet Union to Russia, and many shifts at that time. So it really became obvious that nuclear war or nuclear weapons held by the superpowers were by no means the only threat to peace and human security. This put a lot of demands on active people because it really broadened the agenda. And at that time, I was teaching in the area, and I could feel that because suddenly, you know, it looked as if one would have to have background knowledge about Tito and Yugoslavia and Serbia and all kinds of things with, you know, shifting hot spots and so on. And of course, there are common issues under these things, issues of the effectiveness, the nature of nonviolence and so on. But every place has its own story. So it does become, you know, a, a big agenda, let me say. How were the core activities of the group different in the 90s compared to what they'd been in the 80s? In the educational area, of course, they shifted because we would get speakers and films and panels and we would organize workshops and we would have these on different issues in different places, maybe conflict resolution. We had people coming in who had mediated disputes successfully in various different parts of the world. We actually also inspired some people to go off and initiate projects. I know there was one person who, if I remember correctly, initiated quite a school and training program in Cambodia for persons who had lost their limbs due to landmines. The Landmines Action Committee was another group that sort of was a spin-off locally from the original Plowshares group. So I would just say both at the university and within the group, the range of topics was quite broad at that time. And I would imagine that there was also a profound shift in the group's work after 9-11. Oh, definitely. What did that look like? I was less involved then because I was out of Calgary between 2005 and 2012. The group here survived and some of the original members continued to work very hard. We now are involved in several major events annually. This was a continuation, but we had originally organized a holiday peace fair where groups such as Amnesty and UNICEF came, and sometimes these groups were selling goods as a method of fundraising. We still have that. It's making less money, <laughs> and we're looking at how we might adapt it or change it. And then in the last few years, we've had an event commemorative of Hiroshima Day called the Floating Lantern Event. And that, last summer, attracted actually several thousand people. It's a lot of work to organize, and I haven't personally been involved in that, but it has taken a lot of effort from various volunteers. You know, there are city permits, and there are vendors, and there are speakers, and there's, you know, many, many details about that event. 
So, I mean, those two things have continued on. Meetings have continued on, and I can't speak to the nature of all of the meetings between about 2003 and 2012 because I was less involved during that time. Tell me more about shifting from Project Plowshares Calgary to the Plowshares Calgary Society. Oh, well, this was quite a thing. The Canada Revenue Agency has been really strict on groups that do anything approximating advocacy. The National Project Plowshares Group had been given a charitable status for tax receipts under the Canada Council of Churches. And the Canada Council Churches was undergoing this, I guess, a review by the Canada Revenue Agency. And they actually were advised that the National Project Plowshares still qualified as charitable because the National does a lot of research. But the National, in order to preserve its status, had to get rid of the local groups because the local groups didn't do an equivalent amount of research. So the National then announced to us that we could not get a charitable status through them. Well, this happened last March, and we had to decide what to do. And some people thought, well, maybe we should just give up and die, because we do have a staff person, and we support our staff person in our office through donations. But what we decided was to reconstitute ourselves under a different but related name as a not-for-profit organization within Alberta without the capacity to give receipts for charitable donations. So we are a not-for-profit that is independent of the national. We kept part of the name because our group is really well-known in Calgary and well-regarded, and we didn't want to lose our reputation. But, you know, we're challenged because we now have to raise a certain amount annually without being able to give people charitable receipts. I mean, it wasn't a big fight or anything. It's just that Revenue Canada has become stricter, and we were not willing to say we would cease to advocate for nonviolence, conflict resolution, and against nuclear weapons. So we then became distinct from the national organization. So in the current period, what are the core activities of the Plowshares Calgary Society? The two things I mentioned, this peace fair and this floating lantern ceremony, now we're now looking at a possible project. This is kind of a favorite baby of mine, but I'm not sure it'll go anywhere. We're looking at applying for several grants around the issue of possible returning foreign fighters in the war against ISIS. I'm not sure whether we will do that or not. I'm not positive whether we have the capacity, but we're looking into being able to expand our activities and our staff if we can get a grant for a project, broadly speaking, about restorative justice and the issue of these foreign fighters. We're also looking at adapting our peace fair. And of course, we plan all these meetings. So we get films and resource people and facilitators and so on. We've got a community conference that we're setting up for May 5th, so some of us are working on that. Are you able to say any more about the substance of that possible restorative justice project with returning foreign fighters? Yes, I am, but this should be taken as personal, right, because we haven't really endorsed this as a whole group. The issue of returning foreign fighters is obviously very messy. First of all, let me say, if someone is a Canadian and they have been in a foreign country doing whatever and they want to return to Canada, there's no legal option but to take this person back. You cannot declare somebody stateless. So it may happen that some persons will return to Canada who have been fighting with ISIS. And in fact, it's estimated that there probably are around 250 such people. If these people return to Canada, It may be very difficult to legally charge and convict them because it will be difficult to gather evidence about what they did. So there's a very profound issue for the security of ordinary Canadians and for what is going to happen to these people. So the Canadian government is going to face quite a messy situation about this. And as far as I can tell, the government's policy is to seek to reintegrate and rehabilitate such persons. 
Obviously, a lot of research and thought could go into this. There are many countries who will face this problem. So, I mean, one thing is to find out what are all these people doing about this? I mean, what are the policies that are being implemented and is there evidence of their success or failure? I think this is a very important area that peace groups could certainly work on. It won't win you any friends. <laughs> I mean, it might win you some friends if you talk about the safety of Canadians, but if you talk about how is so-and-so going to be brought back into Canada when he or she has been an ISIS fighter, I don't think anybody's going to be thrilled by that. But, I mean, this is a problem that's coming up. So one way in which our group might develop would be if we could get resources to do some work in this area. So we would then organize conferences and meetings. We would do research. We would write this up. We would, if we were funded, give our results to a relevant organization. I might write an academic paper on this from the perspective of applied ethics. But it is a possible thing. It's not something we are able to undertake just right now. Tell me more about the community conference you have coming up in May. It's called Challenges of Peace and War, and it will have a keynote address, which will, in general terms, be about shifts in Canadian peacekeeping and foreign policy. That will be given by Rob Hubert, who is quite frequently on CBC TV, actually, and he is in strategic studies and political science here. Then we'll have a panel where various people will talk about their greatest current fears or their favorite success stories. And on the panel, we expect to have someone from the Mennonite Central Committee, someone from the Armed Forces, a man who coordinates a peace and conflict program at Mount Royal University, and a woman who's done a lot of evaluation work about the international conflict resolution programs. Now, those latter two people may be called out. They both have some commitments outside the country. If they are, I I may go on that panel myself to replace one or more of them. And then in the afternoon, we'll be showing a film called In Pursuit of Peace, which is quite a good film about local and international conflict resolution efforts in a number of places. But it's a very good film produced by the National Film Board, and we'll have a discussion of that. I mean, with all of these presentations, we'll obviously have a question and answer period. And this event is being sponsored by two groups, the Plowshares Calgary Society and another group, the Calgary Association for Lifelong Learners. How has the importance of nuclear issues shifted over the 35 years of your involvement? I can answer this twice. From the public perspective, it's shifted from high importance to slight importance. From the perspective of our group, I say it remains highly important, partially because one of our most committed and tried and true members is heavily involved in that area and has worked hard with national groups, including national plowshares and various government officials and former government officials. She has been working very hard on that since the early 80s consistently. So we always have updates on what these national groups are doing, the meetings they're organizing, the initiatives they're undertaking, the thinking behind them, and so on. And some of our members do letter write in that particular area. I personally have not worked specifically on that just recently, but I think that public complacency in this area is greatly misplaced. And I think that when you see the rhetoric going back and forth between Donald Trump and the North Korean leader, it's scary stuff. This is not a good time. And people who think that this problem has disappeared are really not correct. You alluded earlier to the fact that Calgary is a pretty conservative place. How has that shaped what it's like to be involved in peacework in the Calgary context? Well, comparatively, this might surprise you. We're actually very successful. We're one of the longest surviving Canadian peace groups, one of the very few with staff and an office. I think what can happen to a person is you sort of get a sheltered life. You may go back and forth between your university and your church and your choir and your various friends, and it's not as if we're really encountering the rabid right 
We did encounter more opposition, I think, in the 80s, and it would often be from people who were very anti-Russian who had maybe immigrated to Canada from Czechoslovakia or somewhere, and they had experienced the heavy hand of totalitarianism and would stand up at meetings and get involved in debates and so on. I think more recently that what tends to happen, and this is regrettable, is people who have those kinds of ideas just don't turn up. So, I mean, you don't wind up talking to them. I think if we were to initiate a project and say, well, we're actually thinking about what might happen to returning ISIS fighters. Well, if word of that got out, I'm sure you'd attract hostility. Over the years, what kinds of connections have there been between your work as a philosopher, your teaching, your scholarly work, your writing, and your piecework? A number of my books, the original ideas came from problems about peace and war. I was at one point for eight months a visiting professor at Mano Simons College, which is in Winnipeg and has a peace and conflict transformation program. Then when I was at the University of Lethbridge, I had a course called Philosophy of Peace. So, I mean, there has been an integration. I've been really interested in issues of trust and also issues of forgiveness and reconciliation. I think my work as a philosopher has actually been really helped by this community involvement. So you've mentioned some of them in the course of the interview, but maybe talk a little bit more about the big things that are coming up for the Plowshares Calgary Society. I would hope that we could strengthen our funding base and engage in more meetings and conferences that have a stronger level of academic content. I mean, obviously, that reflects where I'm coming from. I would also like to strengthen our membership base and particularly with regard to younger members. Many groups, and our group is one, are challenged by the fact that there are a number of members who are older and losing some of their energy for these things. And we would really like to attract people in their 20s, 30s, and so on. And I think if we do initiate this new project I'm contemplating, we would have a fairly good chance of doing that. You have been listening to my interview with Trudy Govier of the Plowshares Calgary Society. To learn more about their work, go to plowshareScalgary.ca. That's plowshareScalgary.ca. To find out more about Talking Radical Radio, the guests, the theme music, and the ways that you can listen, or to suggest topics for future shows, go to TalkingRadical.ca and click on the link for the radio show. On the site, you can sign up for email updates or follow us on Facebook or Twitter. I'm your host, Scott Nye, a writer and media producer based in Hamilton, Ontario, and the author of two books of Canadian history told through the stories of activists, Gender and Sexuality, and Resisting the State, both from Fernwood Publishing. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in again next week. <laughs>